Um, okay, hi. Uh, I hope I can uh, keep you awake for most of the time. So uh, basically, this is a joint work with uh, Colin here, uh, Adi Shamir, and uh, Achio Weigerten. I will take my clicker now. Okay. So the insecurity of IT, IoT devices is all over the news, and every day we hear more and more uh, uh, attacks going on. But most of these attacks simply uh, view these IoT devices as poorly uh, protected computers with an internet connection. For example, using default passwords and, uh, and Linux Busybox in the recent uh, Mirai attack. So we decided to look at threats that are more specific to IoT devices, and we tested, tested the security of the highly popular uh, Philips Hue Smart Light system. We chose this system because it's based on a relatively mature technology with standards that are uh, already undergone several revisions, and it's a relatively simple system to implement. It is a high-end product, and uh, a large company really put a lot of effort into securing this system. Okay, so Zigbee is one of the biggest indus industry standards for IoT, and Zigbee Lightning, or ZLL, is its standard used for Lightning products. And a typical home installation um, includes several light bulbs that can communicate with each other and a, a controller uh, over this uh, ZLL wireless protocol in something called a personal area network, or a PAN, which uses um, encryption with a unique key to protect the, the communication. And the controller can be either a very simple wireless switch or a bridge that connects to the secure home network, and from that it's connected to the internet and can be controlled by a smartphone app. And then the user can uh, turn the lights on and off, change the color, and other stuff that's supposed to be very, very cool. Okay, so uh, we tested the idea of creating a worm, which basically spreads between uh, lamps using only the standard Zigbee wireless protocol. And to do that, we need to overcome two main obstacles. The first one is how to take over a pre-installed light that uh, resides in a different pan with an unknown encryption key. And after we are able to do this, we need to find a way to cause this light to uh, spread uh, the infection and attack the, uh, its nearby neighbors. Okay, so to start uh, the work, we try to reverse engineer the system, break some lights physically, and then uh, connect to and see how it works from the inside. So uh, the first part is uh, taking over pre-installed smart lights. And as we said before, all communication inside the PAN is encrypted, encrypted using uh, a unique encryption key. And there is a protocol that allows the controller to cause uh, a lamp to uh, join its network and send the encryption keys. Uh, however, we need to find a way to stop a malicious neighbor from stealing our lights away from us and controlling them. We don't want him to turn off the light in our bathroom in the middle of the night. So um, uh, ZLL implements something called a proximity test. The lamp basically uh, measures the uh, signal strength of the first protocol message, and only if the, string, uh, the signal is strong enough, indicating that the controller is in a very close physical proximity, it accepts the message and answers and answer it. Otherwise, the message is discarded. So if we look at the outline of the, this protocol, the controller sends something called a scan request. It uh, includes a randomly generated transaction ID that uh, basically identifies this session of the protocol to the rest, uh, with the rest of the messages. The lamp does the proximity test, and if it passes, it answers with a scan response. And after that, the controller can send different kind of messages, either to make uh, the lamp join the network or to uh, reset to factory new, and there are uh, most type of messages. So we uh, needed to find a way to overcome this proximity test because we want to do this attack from a long range. So we looked at, at the specification of the reset to factory new message, and we saw that this mes message only contains one 32-bit uh, random number. It's the famous transaction ID. Uh, but unfortunately for us, we can't set a valid transaction ID because of the proximity test, and we are too far away. So we looked at the small print of the specification, and we saw that this number is supposed to be a non-zero random uh, number. So we asked ourselves, okay, and what if it is zero? So we looked at the implementation, and basically what we've seen that the lamp has a struct that uh, it saves the uh, uh, transaction ID from the first message, and then on the next message received, it simply uh, checks if this uh, new transaction ID matches the one that it stores in memory. 
And I think that you can already guess what is the default value uh, in, this, in this struct. It's, of course, zero. So basically, our very sophisticated attack is this uh, protocol. We simply send one uh, factor reset uh, message with an ID zero. The light uh, restarts, uh, deleting all of uh, its keys. And then when it uh, wakes up, it uh, goes into a backward compatibility mode to an older version of the protocol that doesn't do this proximity test, and so we can take over the lights. After we tested this attack in uh, our lab, we decided to do something related uh, nicer. So we bought very uh, cheap and lightweight uh, transceivers. It cost a few, a few dollars and weights about 20 grams. And we decided to try to uh, put it on a drone and attack uh, a nice office building in Be'er Sheva. It hosted a few relatively famous security companies and also the Israeli CERT. And as you can see in this, uh, in this video, the building is re uh, relatively far away. And this is the drone. The autonomous uh, attack kit is hung by a USB cable underneath the drone. And as the drone takes off, you can see already in the distance the light starting to flicker. This is about 300 meters away, or as I understand, about three football fields. And as we get closer, uh, we can uh, uh, start the second phase of our attack. After we send the factor reset message, we, uh, we cause the slides to join our own new network. We take control over them. And now, um, the, uh, for the people here that are familiar with Morse code, you can see that uh, the lights are signaling SOS, rescue me. They have been taken over, and our attack is done. So uh, basically, we have the first gadget of our attack. We can uh, take over lights from really long distances. And now we need to go to the second phase. OK, so uh, we now uh, looked for a way to uh, run code on the, on the lamp. But it's a relatively big challenge for us, because those lamps use, uh, the CPUs in those lamps are Harvard architecture, and they have really good uh, source base. And uh, it was very hard to try to exploit it. So we decided to try and misuse um, an over-the-air update mechanism that Philips put in, into these uh, lights and use them to uh, spread our malicious code. So we tested these uh, uh, capabilities, and we found out that, unfortunately for us, those uh, updates are encrypted and signed by Philips. Uh, but more fortunately for us, they use only uh, symmetric keys and they use this, the same symmetric keys in all the lamps from a, a specific model. So uh, why did they do it? They, re, they did think about security. So uh, the keys are stored inside a secure system on chip that are protected against debug and uh, read from the outside. So it's, there's no easy way to extract uh, those keys. So we decided to try and use uh, uh, power analysis to extract the keys from the, the lamps. This is the setup that uh, we used. So the first part was basically reverse engineering um, this old software update. It starts from the files that, uh, and, the, and the structure, but we didn't even know what kind of uh, cryptographic uh, primitives were used or what mode of operation. So we did a correlation power analysis with a ciphertext and uh, to help to us to understand how this uh, data is manipulated. And from that, we could deduce that uh, Philips chose to use um, a mode of operation called counter with CBC mark or CCM, which is also used in uh, Zigbee. So now we know what the mode of operation and the primitive, not so surprisingly, is uh, AES block cipher. So we, we want to break it. So if we try to look what is CCM um, mode uh, is made of, um, it's made of a stream cipher that uh, encrypts a nounce and an incremented counter to generate the stream cipher and then sold to the ciphertext. After that, this decrypted plain text is uh, verified using CBC MAC. And unfortunately, again for us, uh, this mode of operation is relatively hard to attack using side channels. And the reason it is that unlike uh, simpler modes like uh, ECB, we don't have any direct control over the input to any of the block cipher operations. So we looked at, at the literature, and there were previous attacks on um, CCM. Uh, the first one requires uh, 2 to the 16 blocks uh, of, in, uh, uh, of encryption to break the scheme. And unfortunately for us, the firmware size was limited to 2 to, to, to the 14. So uh, no luck there. And a more recent uh, attack 
uh, used uh, a chosen nouns attack, an attack against the stream cipher, but we didn't even know what the, um, the nouns is. Uh, so uh, our main observation was that instead of trying to attack this uh, stream cipher, which is very hard, we'll try to attack the uh, verification part instead. And if we look only in this uh, CBC mark verification phase, then we can see that the input to the block cipher is a XOR of three values. The first value is the um, CBC state from the uh, previous block, the stream cipher generated for this, uh, for this specific block, and of course the ciphertext. But if we uh, take a closer look, we can see that the first two uh, values are not dependent at all on the ciphertext that uh, we input. So basically we can view it as a ciphertext, so to some const uh, per block, and then uh, in ECB operation. Again, this can be simplified by simply incorporating this uh, constant into the first uh, round key of the AES. So now we have a very easy to attack uh, scheme, an ECB scheme, and only with a modified key. And this modified key we can attack and extract, and from that we can deduce the original key. And uh, CCM reuses its keys between verification and encryption. So we get both keys for free, and now we are able to um, send and encrypt our own malicious updates. So we did also a small demo uh, for that one. So go over the calling. Actually, we're able to do this. Uh, we have this really simple demo here. These are three Philips Hue light bulbs that were purchased new, and then we've done over-the-air updates. Uh, the firmware that we're running on them now, we've built from source code. So they're not limited to doing just features within the original uh, code base or anything like that. And rather than doing something really evil, I've made a slightly annoying light bulb. This is what we decided to do. Uh, so you can see it blinks on and off. If I turn another light on, it steals control from the other light. Um, so if we wait for another one to turn on here, it's random, so also could be here a while. Uh, there you go. So if you turn this one on, and if I keep trying to switch them, you can see it always keeps only one bulb on. Oops, I missed that one. Um, and it's doing this directly communicating with each other, so as soon as the bulb turns on, it sends a message that will turn others around it off. Um, it's set multicast, so sometimes they get jammed and miss each other's messages, uh, but mostly it works. So this is just a really simple, annoying light bulb example, but there's a few other demos that Elliot can talk about as well here. Yeah. So, um... So now that I hope that we convince you that uh, this worm is possible to make, we want to see, okay, so what is the meaning of that? So um, we wanted to see if we, can, uh, if we can create a worm that spreads, and it does, and now what are the effects? So uh, we look at it as a little bit of a new type of an attack, which is dependent on uh, the density of uh, devices in the area, because uh, we need some critical mass of uh, density to allow this, uh, this worm to spread over large areas. And this is very known uh, percolation theory techniques. We did a back of the envelope calculation for the city of Paris. And we saw that we need about 15,000 uh, randomly located uh, lights for uh, this worm to spread over the entire, the entire city, which we found relatively low in number. Um, so the attack simply starts by taking one uh, malicious uh, light and plug it, plugging it in anywhere in the city. From that, it can spread using this uh, Zigbee uh, protocol. And the nice thing about it is this protocol is not monitored in any way. It's really hard to detect that something is going on, and it's really hard to find the source of this infection. And uh, because we go around any uh, IP defense mechanism, all of the regular protection that we have is not, uh, not going to help us. So what we can achieve with this? Uh, with this attack. So the simple thing is we're going to do a widespread blackout, close off the light in the city. But a nice thing about it is that when we attack those lights, we can permanently break them. There's no way to fix them afterwards. You, the, if you want to uh, turn the lights on, you need to go physically replace this light and put a new one instead of it. It will, might be nice for the lead salespeople, but it will take quite a lot of time to get over this. And uh, we can do more fancy stuff. Um, for one example, we can cause very unusual loads on the electric grid and try to attack the electric grid itself. We can uh, cause epileptic seizures in people that are photosensitive, and it's a very uh, tough uh, problem for someone that's in this situation and the entire city is blinking. 
And uh, because Wi-Fi and Zigbee share the same uh, radio frequencies, we can also jam uh, Wi-Fi uh, in a very large area. Um, we are responsible people, so we did responsible uh, disclosure. And we talk with Philips, and we um, disclose all of the vulnerabilities a uh, few months before we, we published. And the, pro the protocol implementation bug was actually fixed using the same software update mechanism that uh, we attacked previously, which is nice because it is a security mechanism. Unfortunately, it wasn't secure enough. Um, currently, the software update process is still uh, vulnerable. OK, so if we try to look at uh, what went wrong in a more uh, high-level view, uh, with us IoT revolution, we're going to put billions of tiny transmitters all around us. And those tiny transmitters have the ability to create small ad hoc networks. But these ad hoc networks can be converted maliciously to very large area networks and create a new communication medium. This communication medium is currently not monitored and not protected in any way. And we need to find ways to uh, make uh, IoT devices that are more secure, but also um, secure this new medium that uh, we are creating. Okay, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's thank Steve. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, well, you think your question. Oh, Peter. Hi, Minister. I, many years ago, when I was a kid, there was a movie by uh, Charlie Chaplin in which uh, he was a glazer. He went around fixing broken windows. And he was hiring all the kids to, uh, to break the windows so that he'd have business. Uh, I'm wondering here whether one should go out and uh, invest in Philips, because uh, if you guys are loose uh, breaking uh, all of the windows in a particular city, this, that's purely apocryphal. Uh, the real question is, if you were designing uh, the Internet of Things uh, to assure that you had uh, smart light bulbs that were adequately protected, um, and you were working, say, with Philips, what would you do? Um, I think the first thing is to, uh, the, first, the main problem was in the threat model, because they did put a lot of effort in defending the system, but for example, uh, the threat model didn't, didn't consider anyone extracting the keys, phys keys physically out of the lamp. We did it in side channels attack. I'm sure there are ways to just um, connect it to the chip with more violent method and retrieve those keys. And actually, Zigbee supports uh, uh, OTI app that is specific to each light. So they could use uh, different keys, but it wasn't in the threat model. And I feel that uh, if you look at the, the way that the Zigbee protocol was uh, created, it was, it was a closed uh, industry protocol and didn't uh, include any outside security advice. And I feel that if it will be done in a more inclusive way, we can make much better protocols that will have lesser uh, probability of being implemented uh, wrongly and uh, help to make a better uh, threat model that we can actually protect. Another question? Hi, Federico Maggi, Trend Micro. Have you looked into Z-Wave uh, by any chance? Um, I just seen today that they opened the specification a while ago, um, yeah. so not yet. Because I think there, there might be you know, similar I, positions. I will assume so. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you again, speaker. Thank you.